Good afternoon, everybody, and a very warm welcome to our Marketing Club webinar series. We've got a fantastic session for you today on filmmaking with Amy Bryant and Sarah Swafferton. If you've watched any of our Marketing Club webinars before, then you'll know how this works. But for those joining us for the first time today, I'll very quickly give you some info about the session, how you can submit your questions for Q&A, and where to go if you want to watch the session again. So I'll be hearing from Amy and Sarah for around 45 minutes. We'll then move into a 10 to 15 minute Q&A to answer some of your questions. Please do post your questions at any time during the session by clicking on the question mark you'll see on screen. We've circled the question mark for you, so if you're watching on a laptop, you'll find it on the right hand side of your screen or on the top or bottom if watching on a tablet or a smartphone. Both Amy and Sarah have, been, have very kindly agreed for the slides to be available to download whilst we're broadcasting. So if you pop into the handout section, which looks a little like a memo icon with the top edge folded over, you can download them from there. If you want to watch the session again, you'll be, it will be available on our YouTube channel shortly after the broadcast. Just head into the Marketing Club folder, which you'll find under playlists. You'll find the entire back catalogue of the Marketing Club series in there too, with sessions covering a broad range of marketing skills and personal skills, all free to access and available whenever you want. So do take a look as we've had some fantastic sessions since the series started. If you'd like to share any thoughts about today's webinar on the socials, you can use the hashtag CIM events. We'd love to see your comments on the socials, so we'll pop the hashtag up again after Amy and Sarah have finished their presentations. So before we get into the presentation, I'll just quickly explain what the Marketing Club is. It was created primarily to help students get the most from their CIM accredited degree and prepare them for a career in marketing. Although the Marketing Club is designed for students, CIM members and other marketing practitioners are also welcome to attend the sessions. For the uninitiated, the CIM accredited degree program enables students to gain a professional marketing qualification by taking advantage of the exemptions the accredited degree provides. So if you're a university student, you can sign up now to receive the Marketing Club newsletter. All you need to do is take a photo of the QR code on screen. Alternatively, you can hop onto our website to find the Marketing Club webpage with the qualifications drop down menu. Each edition of the newsletter will provide you with content designed to support your studies and actively manage your professional development by keeping you up to date with the latest trends, innovations and concepts in the marketing industry. So it really is worth taking a look and signing up. We'll pop the QR code up again a little later when we head into the Q&A if you want to find out further information or sign up. Okay. So I'd now like to introduce our guest speakers, Amy Bryant and Sarah Swartafin. I'll pass things over to you, Amy, and the floor is yours when you're ready. Great, thanks very much. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I'm Amy and um, my colleague Sarah will be, be coming online to speak to you shortly. And uh, we both work for the BFI, the British Film Institute. Um, we're a charity and the UK's leading organisation for film and the moving image. This picture on the screen at the moment is one of the many vaults at the BFI National Archive, where we look at after one of the largest and most important collections of film and TV in the world. The films in our collection are a fascinating record of the history, culture and art of filmmaking and TV production as well as a document of daily life in the UK from the late 19th century to today. I wanted to flag that some of the collection is available to view online, and there's nearly 500 adverts, including an amazing 1942 personal advertorial and a 15 second Branston Pickle ad from 1957. I'm gonna ask Lise to put the links in the chat to the personal and Branston Pickle adverts because they're great, and a link where you can search to view others and it's it's all free i just thought it, i'd flag it because um alongside the kind of film and tv programs we do hold this amazing collection of, of adverts um i wanted to start by talking about this work um to say that we do it so that it's preserved for future generations and when i say we what i really mean is our colleagues because i work in business development and sarah works in education um, however much of my role and career has been in marketing and Sara is a filmmaker as well as the course director on our Chartered Institute of Marketing courses. 
We're both passionate about developing filmmaking skills and helping people understand what these transferable skills can help with. So we hope you'll come away from today feeling that you have either started on or moved forwards in your filmmaking journey. We're going to focus on smartphone shooting and Sara is going to invite you to have a go at some of the techniques and tips she gives you as we go along. But um, before I hand over to Sara to introduce herself and get stuck into today's webinar, I wanted to set the scene. Why does film and storytelling matter and why should we give it a second thought? This on the screen is a picture of Paul Mescal and Frankie Corio from director Charlotte Wells' film After Sun. Uh, Charlotte actually won a BAFTA for Outstanding Debut by a British writer, director or producer last month. And After Sun is just one of the many films backed by the BFI Film Fund with National Lottery money. So if you've seen a BFI logo at the start of a film, it means that we funded it. As a government arm's length body, alongside funding and preserving film, the BFI work with government and industry on policy and strategy, the distribution of funds, conducting research and much, much more. And we do this because society needs stories and film, TV and the moving image bring stories to life, helping us to connect and understand each other better. So what I'm saying is the BFI champion the moving image in all of its forms to create the greatest possible choice, access and opportunity for all. Because film allows us to tell, to tell stories and start conversations, and as I mentioned earlier, we want to educate and deepen public appreciation and understanding of film and the moving image. And the term moving image is deliberately used here because we all engage with different forms of content and the move towards a digital world combined with the quality, accessibility and ease of smartphone filmmaking means we can all tell stories. Our mission, at the BFI includes supporting creativity and actively seeking out the next generation of UK storytellers. And while this is people like Charlotte Wells, I mentioned earlier, this also means you. In his article, Why Filmmaking is a must have skill in a digital world, journalist Steve Hemsley wrote that marketing directors and managers will be looking for filmmaking skills on marketers CVs in the future. They know that in a digital world and with growing demand from consumers, the compelling video, marketing teams must be able to make the most of moving image content to serve brands and deliver results from different platforms. If you want to read that article, by the way, it's available on the Charles Institute Marketing's content hub. Uh, Lisa's going to put the uh, link in the chat for you again. The title of the article is Why Filmmaking is a Must Have in a Digital World. My team delivered some training for Durham University recently and uh, what stuck in my mind was a, a student that had a part-time job as a content creator said that the training got her thinking about what draws her attention and how she can channel that reflection into her work. Um, one other thing I want to share with you was Tim Platt, who's our head of marketing at the BFI, wrote in uh, the Chartered Institutes of Marketing's Cassis magazine that the flexibility of moving image is, is its strength. He said that in a crowded market, a compelling story alongside a skilled use of image and sound can deliver impacts in many areas, such as recruitment, thought leadership, infographics, events, and charitable appeals, to name just a few. Um, as mentioned previously, we have um, a couple of courses with the Chartered Institute of Marketing, a, a 3.5 hour principles level filmmaking storytelling fundamentals course and a two day intermediate course filmmaking and video production for marketers. Uh, they are both online and taught by the lovely Sarah. They're both um, available to search on the Charles Institute of Marketing website if you just go to the training courses list and type in BFI um, it will come up there. Um, we may well develop new courses so searching BFI is the best way to keep up to date. We've got the two courses they're both taught by the lovely Sarah who I'm going to hand you over to. Um, Sarah is going to give you a taster of how you can start capturing high quality smartphone content. Oh, thank you so much, Amy, for that. Um, okay, so yeah, has, hello everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak to you today um, on the Chartered Institute of Marketing's Filmmaking for Marketers webinar. Um, as Amy said, my name is Sarah and I work for the British Film Institute. Um, I'm a film educator and I have been teaching 
filmmaking and film production uh, to children, teenagers, university students and professionals. Um, and I've been doing this for about 10 years now. Um, I've worked for different cultural organizations internationally. And uh, right now, as Amy said, I, um, I also teach on a few Chartered Institute uh, for marketing courses uh, that I can show you now actually maybe that would be nice uh, so we've got the we've got the three and a half hour fundamentals course and we've got the two-day filmmaking and video production for marketers course um, that I teach online um, okay so let's get started on filmmaking then um, so filmmaking can be broken down into five different stages and you would usually follow this, um, this kind of sequence of stages. So you usually start with development. This is where you come up with um, ideas for your video or for your film. Then you go into pre-production, which is uh, the stage where you plan everything before you start shooting. Um, the shooting of your video would be the production stage. Um, once you've finished filming everything, you go into post-production. So think about editing, sound mixing, color grading, adding, you know, effects, graphics, etc. And um, once everything is finalized, you finish your edit, uh, you would then go into uh, distribution because obviously you want to share your video, share your work with your audience and with the rest of the world. Um, so as I said, development is a stage where you brainstorm uh, your ideas. Uh, you come up for ideas for your videos. This is usually the stage where you do research. You collect visual uh, material to inspire your video. You maybe write like a one-liner or an outline for your video, um, especially if you're doing this for work. This would be the stage where you uh, write everything up so that you can maybe pass it on to your manager who can then sign it off. Um, but this would also be the stage in which you're thinking about the aim of your video and what kind of video would suit this aim and suit uh, your target audience. Um, so I think I am talking to a mixture of people. Some of you might be students, uh, some of you might be further along in your career. Um, so I would like you guys to think about the content strategies that either a brand that you like or uh, and know well, uh, or you know the company that you work for, for example. And I just have a think about what kind of content you see out there. So content on social media, content on YouTube, content on TV uh, and, and cinemas. Uh, what style is this video in? Is it a professional and slick video or is it more an authentic and accessible video? Is it more like a short form video, a long advert, for example? Um, so there's lots of different video content strategies that um, marketers use um, and I've put two of them here on the screen. Um, so on the left we see thought leadership, um, which is basically the strategy where you want to showcase yourself as an expert and as an authority in your field or in your industry. Uh, whereas uh, on the right we've got social proof and this is where you want to get others, um, you know, you can get your customers, your employees, your team members uh, to show how great you are. So, as I said, if you work in marketing or if you study marketing, th these might be familiar to you. Um, but these two strategies work really well with video content. And if you're starting out with video marketing, um, these are really, really good strategies to start out with because they, the, vid the videos um, that I've put underneath in the bullet points, uh, the examples. Um, they're easy to produce, they're quick to produce, um, and yeah, really doable if you're, if you're starting out, um, especially, you know, you can just get your smartphone out and, and start filming some thought leadership videos, you can start filming some positive brand sentiment videos, etc. I just wanted to show you a couple of statistics um, that are compelling about video marketing. Obviously, video content in marketing has become content that is the most consumed um, and most engaged with by consumers um, and by um, your audience. Um, reportedly, the world watches a billion hours of video social content uh, per day. 
so a billion hours can you imagine and this is only on youtube as well so if you count count up um all the other <laughs> platforms it's obviously more um and this is just because not only is video an engaging medium but it can also unpack a lot of information in a short amount uh, in a short period of time so obviously if you think about um, videos that you watch on TikTok, for example, these are all really, you know, most of them are really short videos, you know, 10, 15 seconds long. And in that 50 sec 15 seconds, you can tell a whole story, right? So this is why video is used um, a lot within marketing because it's useful uh, and it's an engaging content. I've got these uh, statistics from a few different sources, by the way. So from uh, HubSpot from Forbes and also from Demand Sage, which is um, uh, a business intelligence platform. So, um, in 2023, uh, online video is expected to account for 82.5% of all web traffic. So, this is this makes it the most popular kind of content um, and information that we see online. Um, it's also reported that 95% of consumers retain information uh, that is communicated by video compared to 10% who retain information by reading. And I think this is so true because um, I remember I was teaching a course uh, three years ago, um, a similar course to this or, or a course on video marketing. And one of the students showed me a video, uh, an advert, um, of products that you know they wanted to share because they really liked it and to this day I still remember what the brand was I still remember uh, I still remember what um, what they were selling um, and the story that was told within that advert within that I think 30 seconds advert um, and that's crazy I mean that's three years ago I can't remember anything that I read yesterday for example you know, word for word, I can't remember that, but I can remember a video that I watched three years ago. And um, so this just kind of shows how, uh, what a great medium video, video is. 90% um, of consumers have indicated that product videos inform their, their purchasing decisions directly. Uh, this content um, is usually viewed on smartphones. 75% um, of video viewing worldwide happens on smartphones. Um, so that's, that's quite a big statistic, isn't it? And then 92% of those videos viewed on their smartphones are shared compared to other ways of viewing video. So this is quite an important statistic to keep in mind because if you're making your videos um, and you know this fact, this number, uh, this data, uh, then obviously you want to make sure that your video would suit um, you know, this smartphone viewing and uh, smartphone sharing. So what does that mean? Does, does that mean that you, you, need, you might need to make your video a vertical video instead of uh, one that's in landscape, one that's horizontal, for example? 92% um, of video marketers reported that video gives them a positive return on investment. Again, a really, really high statistic. And then the last uh, stat here is 94% of marketers claim that video has improved customer knowledge of their goods or services. So it's a really nice medium to engage with your audience and build relationships with your customers. Okay, so now that we've kind of, we've, we've thought about um, the aim of our video, we have an idea of what we want to film, then you go into uh, the next stage, which is pre-production. Um, this is the stage where you prepare everything that you need before you start filming. It's really, really important that when you uh, that you actually plan your shoot, um, because if you don't have a plan in advance, you end up wasting quite a bit of time and resources. Um, just think about, you know, if you're, let's say, you know, you know that uh, on Thursday, second of March, I'm going to film something. You turn up uh, on that day, and you know, you you need to spend some time on location thinking about what you're what you're going to do and where you're going to set up the camera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's going to cost a lot of time. And especially if you have, let's say, people helping you with your shoot, you're wasting their time as well. Maybe, you, you, you know, you had to pay them for the day, you know, to come and help. Then you're wasting your money as well. Um, some of you might have to do ad hoc filming in their work. Um, 
for example, if you say you work uh, for a company and you, there's an event or whatever, and uh, you have to capture that event on video, for example, you might think, oh, you know, well, I can't plan for that because, you know, I'm going to an event, I'll just see what happens and I'll film. Um, but I think if you if you have an idea, uh, even just like a really rough idea uh, written down or even just in your head um, of what the shots are that you need to capture to make sure that you can tell a good story in your video, it will really, really help you because I think video is all about storytelling. So if you have an, an idea of what the story should be and what kind of uh, images, what kind of clips you need to tell that story, it will really help make your video um, better and it, it will elevate it. So what do you need to plan your shoot? Um, you might have some kind of scripts. Um, you know, this is, it's not like for uh, every time that you need a script. For example, if you're doing the event video, you might not need some kind of script, but maybe you're doing uh, an interview video that needs a little bit of scripting, that needs a little bit of like question uh, prep, um, that kind of stuff. Uh, you might need a shot list. So this is what I was talking about um, earlier with the thinking about the shots that you need to tell your story. Having a shot list uh, prepared is really, really helpful. You might want to draw some storyboards as well. Uh, you know, a list of locations that you need um, to film your video. Things like a list of props, your costumes, um, you know, if you're filming something that's around uh let's say cricket i'm teaching a course for cricketers so cricket is the only example i can think of right now but let's say you're filming something around cricket uh then you might want you know to have someone play a bit of cricket so you might need uh, a cricket bat and a ball as your props um and then a list of people that you have involved in your shoot where, when they need to be present, you know, what their roles are, what they need to bring, etc. Uh, you might also want to prepare your equipment as well uh, and just make sure that you have enough like uh, power and storage because you don't want to uh, be on location and then your phone dies or something or you don't have enough, yeah, you don't have enough memory on your phone or, or your SD card. So once you have a plan and you've done your pre-production, we go into the next stage which is the production stage. Uh, so yeah, so you can start shooting your video. I've put some tips here on the screen. Um, so let, let's just go through them one by one. So make sure that you your shots are as stable and as smooth as you can get them. So you might wanna invest in like a tripod or a gimbal if your budget allows for it, for example, but it will just help you, yeah, it will just help you um, stabilize your shots. Um, you can turn on your grid lines on your smartphone if you're shooting on your smartphone uh, to help you with composition. And I'll talk a little bit more about this um, in the next slide. Um, make sure that your framing is correct. So use the correct so shot sizes and try not try to um, try not to cut off people's limbs awkwardly. So don't try, you know, don't cut them off by their feet, for example. Make sure that you just go a little bit further to show the feet or go a little bit closer to cut off at the at the knees, for example, which is the next correct shot size. Um, try to avoid using your zoom function, especially if you're filming on your smartphone, um, because this will reduce the quality of your image and make the video look um, more pixelated. So if you need to get a close-up shot, just move your camera closer to the subject or, or get the subject to move closer to you, for example. Um, pay attention to your location and your uh, set. Um, so it's, you know, just things like, is the lighting okay? Is there a lot of background noise? Can you move somewhere else, you know, where it's a little bit quieter? Is there anything messy uh, and distracting in the background? I think that's a really important one. Um, yeah, so try to get the background um, and your set to enhance your story as well, if, if it's possible, you know? So for example, if you're filming uh, an interview video with um, a painter, an artist, um, maybe film the, the interview at their studio so that the audience can become really immersed um, in the topic of the video. And it's just nice to see, you know, to see something that's relevant to that topic as well. 
Um, so I would actually like to invite you to pick up your smartphone now, um, if you haven't done this, and just try uh, one thing with me, which is to, to turn on your grid lines. Um, so you should be able to go, if you have an iPhone, you should be able to go to your settings and then uh, look for camera. Underneath composition, you will see something called grid and you can turn that on. And when you go back to your camera app, you should see these lines uh, like you see on the screen. Um, on other phones, I think you should be able to do the same. Uh, it will be either in settings or within your camera app that you can turn on the grid lines. Um, but basically, why, why I'm um, asking you to do this is because the grid lines will help you with your composition, as I said, um, following a rule called the rule of thirds. Um, so I think, you know, most of you might know about this or not, um, but with the rule of thirds, what you're doing is you divide your frame into nine um, rectangles um, using two vertical and then two horizontal lines. Um, and what you want to do is you want to place the subject of your shot, which uh, in this shot is uh, Paul Mescal. And um, you, yeah, and you want to make sure that you, uh, you place that subject of your shot uh, or whatever you want your audience to pay attention to around these intersecting points or where the vertical and the horizontal lines intersect. This is just because this, this is a very old rule, I think from like Renaissance painting, um, but basically our eyes are automatically drawn to those intersecting points. So yeah, so you can see we've got uh, this intersecting point and just really close by it is, um, is his eyes. And again, if you're framing um, a subject, if you're framing a person, sorry, um, you wanna make sure, uh, you wanna keep in mind that the eyes of a person are the most important thing. So um, if, for example, you want your audience to relate to you, make sure that they can actually see your eyes in your video. Um, so yeah, so in this shot, we've got his eyes close to that intersecting point. And what we've also got is we've got him placed uh, on the left line in this image. And we've got him looking kind of towards his left or towards our right. And what we've got is we've got quite, a, we've got an empty space here. Um, we call this the looking space. So he's looking this way. And that space that he's looking into is called the looking space. You want to make sure that um, you keep the looking space free. If, for example, you, you decide to place him on this side of the frame, um, but he's still looking the same way, so he's still looking towards our right and looking outside of the frame, what you've got here is you've got dead space. And you want to avoid that. You want to make sure that everything in your shot contributes to telling your story. Um, so if you do decide to um, put him on this side, make sure that he's looking towards his looking space, or if he's looking that way towards his right still, and we've got space behind him, um, you can do that uh, as long as it has some kind of narrative function. So if something else is happening behind him, then of course you can put him on this side um, and make him look outside of the frame. Um, okay, so I just wanted to quickly chat about um, shooting on your smartphone. Um, so when you're shooting a video, whether on your smartphone or on your DSLR actually, the more control you have over the technical aspects of the camera, the better the image will look. So um, technical aspects that you can keep in mind are things like your aperture. So your aperture is basically how how big the opening is of your lens. So if you're using DSLR, obviously you have a proper lens. If you're using a smartphone, the lens is already built in, so you can't really change that much about the aperture. But on some newer smartphones, um, you can see that you can kind of control it, and it's expressed in like f stop. So it will say f 2.8 or f uh, 3.5 or whatever. So play around with that if if your if your phone does have that function. Um, you can also um, keep uh, your shutter speed in mind, uh, things like your ISO or your gain. So these are all things that kind of control the exposure of your image. So how bright or how dark the image looks. 
Um, another kind of technical aspect that's really, really helpful to understand is your white balance. Uh, white balance is basically um, how the, uh, basically controlling the color temperature within your image. So um, if, again, if your camera or, uh, or your phone has that function, most DSLRs have that function anyway, you can play around with it. Um, what you basically want is you want the whites in the image um, uh, on your screen to be the same white as, uh, same color white as you see in real life. So play around with, with the white balance. And then another thing that you can um, practice doing as well is things, uh, is your focus. So um, most of you will probably use autofocus uh, or probably have used autofocus. Try using the manual focus as well, especially if you're using a DSLR camera or a mirrorless camera with um, a detachable lens. Play around you know, with your manual focus and see how, if you can experiment with depth of field. Depth of field is basically um, how much of uh, your subject is in focus and how much of your background is out of focus. So um, I think what makes it an image look really cinematic is to have that kind of blurry background, that depth of field. So play around with the manual focus if you can. Um, another thing that I would like you to think about as well when you're shooting your video is um, just to know where you are when, and what the light is like. So if you're shooting in daytime, um, make as much use um, of natural lighting as possible because you know natural light is the strongest light obviously the sun is the, the brightest light that there is um, so try using using that sunlight as your um, main source of light um, you want you want the subject to be placed in the spill of the natural light and uh, you don't want your um, you don't want to sh uh, shoot with your camera facing the light directly. Uh, so you don't want the sun directly in front of the camera. You want to be either on its side or like behind it. Um, so play around with, with this stuff. You know, you can practice with maybe if there's someone living in your house, um, place them, you know, against, against the window or close to the window and see what, uh, what it looks like if you, um, if you put your camera, you know, on its side by, uh, by the window, or if you place it, or if you have your back against the window, just see what that looks like and see what, what um, suits your aesthetic choices as well. If you're shooting at nighttime um, without extra lights, see if you can use things like table lamps to illuminate your subject as well. Um, obviously, you can also invest in some lights as well if you're planning to use them a lot in your work. Um, okay, so we've, what we've got here is just a slide of a few shot sizes. Um, there's, a, there's more shot sizes um, out there, but these are, I would say, the most common ones and the, the, the useful ones that you would use in your work. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them, but I think what I, wanna, what I want to point out is that every, what you think about film, film is a visual medium, so every every choice that you make, everything that you put in your frame, how you position your subject, where you place the camera in relation to your subject has uh, a meaning, even though you might not know it. Um, but because we've all grown up looking at images, uh, whether it's photographs or whether it's films, we are all familiar with this kind of film language or the meaning behind uh, different shots and, and um, yeah, and, and, and an image. So for example, if I were to um, use this very long shot um, in my narrative film, and I want to introduce my main character with this very long shot, I might want to say, okay, well, you know, they're really, really small in the shot. Maybe I want to say that they're feeling quite overwhelmed by the world. They're lonely because, you know, this, this location is quite barren, quite gray. Um, and yeah, they, they might be a little bit sad, right? Uh, whereas if I decide to use this big close-up, I might want to say, okay, this is a very dramatic moment. There's nothing else in the frame that distracts my audience um, from, uh, apart from the main character. So the only thing they can see is this character's face. 
Um, so that means that I want to draw all the attention onto this character. We want the audience to be right in the character's inner world. Um, they might, you know, I can see every kind of facial expression, every emotion, every wrinkle uh, or whatever on her face. Um, so I might use this shot, you know, in in a moment of in a moment of heightened drama, uh, or just to show um, my character's emotion. So all of these, yeah, as I said, that's a really important thing to remember. Anything that you put in frame, from uh, color to where your character is, to what the location is, to um, whether it's nighttime or daytime, everything of this. Um, what we call mise en scène um, has a meaning and can really contribute to to your storytelling. Um, okay, and then so you you filmed everything and now you are ready for your post production. So you're going to edit your video. Um, I think it's really important that when you're um, when you're planning and when you're shooting your video, you're already thinking of thinking ahead. Uh, um, thinking about your edits. Um, so what I mean by that is when you're planning your video, for example, you're making your shot list, um, make sure that you, th you think about your edit in terms of maybe if you're filming a shot of the same person or the same subject, maybe get, get a, a few different angles or a few different uh, you know, shot sizes um, of the same subject, just so, just so it gives you more choice when you're editing. But it will also make your film more engaging for the audience because you know they can see different sides of the same scene and different uh, perspectives of the same scene. Um, it will also make your film look more professional. Um, it's also important to think about B-roll footage uh, before you start shooting. So what I mean with B-roll is basically extra footage. So edit. so you don't necessarily need the B-roll footage to tell your story. But it is really, really useful. So um, B-roll footage can help you set the tone of your video. It can illustrate things that are being said in the video. So thinking back to um, my video about the artist, my interview video about the artist, um, my B-roll footage could be um, some shots of her, maybe in action, maybe she's painting, or maybe some shots of, uh, I don't know, a gallery where we can see her works. Uh, being displayed, for example. So these are not necessarily things that you need because the interview would be the thing that you need to tell your story. But it just helps. It just you know it just gives the audience a bit more uh, a bit more excitement as well to see you know this other kind of footage rather than just someone talking to camera. Um, and ultimately, it helps you so much with editing as well because sometimes you re you'll realize that. Um, Maybe you know when you're editing and you actually think, oh, these cuts seem really jarring, or maybe you've made a mistake in continuity or something. Um, if you have that B-roll, what you can do is you can hide that mistake by overlaying that footage on top of your primary footage, and uh, essentially you're hiding that cut or that jarring cut. It can also help you pad your edit um, and get your pacing right. So instead of just having someone talk to you um, for 10 minutes or for five minutes, you can you know, give the audience a bit of a break and maybe get, you know, just show them a little bit of the scenery, show them a bit of the sky or you know, some trees or whatever, just to give them a, yeah, a break, a pause um, in, in their concentration. Um, having a neat and well-paced edit will make your video more engaging to your audience and will make your video look more professional as well. So um, I teach Adobe Premiere Pro um, on the two-day course that we mentioned at the start. Uh, this is the industry-grade software, um, but otherwise there are tons of free editing software that you can try out. Um, I really like DaVinci Resolve because it's free and it's a really good one, especially if you want to learn a lot about color grading. That's a really good uh, software. And uh, what I have on my phone, I have a few free stuff on my phone as well. Um, I usually use iMovie um, or an, an app called OpenShot, but there's, there's tons um, out there. Um, if you have some experience in editing, by the way, using any kind of software and you want to learn a new software, such as, for example, Premiere Pro, um, 
please don't be discouraged by like you know or overwhelmed by uh the the interface of the software because once you actually know the editing principles uh once you've learned editing on one software you can always transfer these skills to any kind of software the only thing that you would need to learn is just like the buttons and where everything is um and the interface so i think if you have experience in editing you're already yeah it's already really really good um okay so then the last stage is your distribution stage um obviously you've created your video and now you want to share it with your with your audience you, would, you don't want to keep it to yourself you want to uh share it with the world um and a really good way to do this obviously is through social media um there's obviously lots of social media platforms um some maybe you know if you work for a company you might have a few different accounts on different social media platforms i think because there are so many the ideal practice is to repurpose your uh, video for each platform so you might record one kind of like master video and edit that into one master video that's quite long um, and then what you could do is you can edit um, you can create different versions of that master video um so that it's repurposable for uh, a specific social media platform because i think um it's a known fact that um uh people users expect and consume videos differently on each platform uh depending on what they're using uh so it's like things like length uh, of the video things like the you know the video dimensions so is it a vertical video or is it a horizontal video etc these can really vary from platform to, uh, to platform. I've put here some ideal lengths um, for your video. I've got this from uh, Hootsuite. Obviously you can like deviate a little bit from, from these lengths, uh, but it's, it's good to keep these in mind when you're editing your video for those uh, specific social media platforms. Um, and then just finally, a few tips uh, to make your video stand out. Um, so, uh, tell stories. I think I mentioned that a, a few times during this webinar. Um, yeah, tell, tell a story in your video, even if it's a five second video, a 10 second video, try to, to tell some kind of story because it makes your audience remember your message and it makes your audience remember your brand better as well. Um, like the example that, that I said, uh, of the student who showed me something three years ago, I can still remember what is in that video because there was a story. Um, save the best for the first. Obviously, you know, you go on so your a company social media platform and you want, you know, you want the the users to um, see the best best stuff first. <laughs> That's why you can you, you know you can pin some videos on your Instagram or on, on your TikTok um no uh, include a call to action i think that's that's quite um uh, that makes sense you know you want to direct your audience to something else you want them to do something else after they finish watching your video um no hard selling so um keeping things really authentic um and yeah making the selling quite subtle uh, is really really helpful uh, and doesn't put your audience off as well and then um, adding captions is quite useful as well, just to make your video a bit more accessible. Um, so, okay, and we've come to the end of, of, of my bit. Um, uh, so we have made a really useful how-to video, um, how to get started with video marketing. So if you, can, you, if you want to watch that, you can search BFI how-to video marketing in Google and you'll find it it's on the bfi website um you can also uh sign up to our training if you want to learn more about this um you can just go to the c uh, cim.co.uk uh forward, forward slash training and look for bfi on there um and uh yeah just let us know what your thoughts are on this webinar you can email the email address that's on the screen there and I think, yeah, I, Amy mentioned this at the beginning, uh, the BFI is a charity. So the more attractive our courses are, the more we can help fund our charitable activities as well, such as, you know, the education stuff that I do. <laughs> um, so uh, people who attend our courses are helping to support learning 
training and um, funding across film and the moving image. So thank you for listening. And I think we've got uh, the Q&A now. That was really excellent. Thank you, Sarah, and, and thank you, uh, Amy. Um, yes, we are going to move into a, a Q&A session. So um, we've got quite a few uh, questions that have uh, come in, uh, Sarah and Amy, a lot of them are sort of technical ones. Um, so where do I start? Let's have a look. Um, yes, yeah, somebody has asked, uh, what equipment would you recommend investing in as a standard kit for filming? OK. Um, so it really depends if you if you were thinking of purchasing a camera or just keeping uh, or, or just filming on your smartphone. Um, I would say, yeah, so make a decision about that. Um, if you do decide to purchase a camera, um, going for, you know, a mirrorless or DSLR camera is really uh, good. You don't have to think about, you know, a 4K camera or, you know, proper film camera. Just have something that's compact that you can take with you um, to different locations. And then I think the most important things are things like um, maybe like a microphone if you're doing a lot of interviews. Uh, so investing in like a lapel mic or something like that is really, really useful. Um, so the camera, tripod, and then uh, maybe a set of LED lights so that you, uh, yeah, so that you have, you can control the lighting a little bit more and you don't have to rely on natural light uh, all the time because, you know, in the UK it's quite difficult <laughs> to rely on light. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, great. There are one or two questions around uh, editing. So, could you please repeat the name of the editing tool you mentioned, other than iMovie? Um, yes. Yeah, so, on the phone, I also have OpenShot, which is a free um, app, editing app. Um, and then uh, the other one that I mentioned, the free one for your computer, is DaVinci Resolve. All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, Okay, so there's a couple of questions relating to um, the length of video. So first of all, what tactics can you use to get viewers engaged with your video content for longer? In a world of TikTok, where short form is popular, do you think there is still a place for long form? I, I mean, I think so. Um, I think what, what, I've, what I see a lot on TikTok is um, the way that they grab uh, the viewer's attention is to start even like to start with the with like the punchline uh, i guess you know if um i get a lot of uh, <laughs> i get a lot of food videos get a lot of recipe videos so they usually show the final product first the final a dish and then and then they go back and you know tell you how the how the dish is made so i think um yeah i think thinking about these kind of um tactics uh, would be good to keep someone's attention because they they already know it's almost it's kind of strange they know what's coming but it, it makes people want to watch and see how how it's done what do you think amy yeah, i have to say i agree like i, I think that there is a, a balance isn't there between you know we know that people are expecting um you know quick quick engagement quick answers to questions and yeah, there is definitely, I don't know, think about like the John Lewis ads, how, you know, how impactful they are and how people do really connect. And then that's because of the story. So I think if you have a story that's worth telling, um, then then absolutely it, it, it can connect. But I suppose it's always trying to find the most um, effective, compelling way to tell that story and not to just take longer for the sake of it if you can tell that story well in a shorter length of time then then absolutely do it yeah definitely just yeah select what what uh what is really really necessary to tell your story and otherwise cut, out, cut all the fluff out <laughs> okay. um some more technical questions uh what's the best directional mic or lapel mic would you suggest um i think uh anything by road is road is a really good brand um for microphones um i uh yeah 
that, that's that's my suggestion um you can get you can get more affordable ones on amazon which are also quite good quality though um but yeah road is a really good brand okay so that's sound so lighting um, is there a cheap portable way to bounce natural light yes actually uh well you can you can buy a set of reflectors um again through amazon or any other online um shop um for i think 50 pounds where you get different kinds of reflectors and stuff um but if you want to just sort of try it out first i've done this before actually you can just get a piece of like cardboard <laughs> from uh you know from a package that you've received or whatever and wrap it in tin foil and then it becomes a reflector as well or if you have a mirror that you can move around that can be a reflector as well okay um lenses next would you recommend lens filters e.g nd or polarizing filters how can you ad adapt these to work on mobile devices okay so yeah so if you if you have a, a dslr or a mirrorless camera and you know that you're going to shoot outside a lot i think getting an nd filter is really really helpful um if you're shooting on your smartphone i would say um yeah you can get it but uh, because because your smartphone um i think it's easier to control things like the exposure and stuff you don't necessarily need to get a filter for it but you can if you want and um you know you can play around with that as well okay yeah. um storage video takes up so much storage where and how do you store your footage okay so um uh so I have a hard drive, so that's where I have all my all my footage. And then for my phone, I I pay for extra storage. So I, it's so annoying. Uh, I pay for the iCloud um, storage thing. So I pay what is it? I think it's only like one pound a month. So it's not it's not too bad. But um, yeah, I do pay for extra storage. Having a hard drive is really helpful though, just to save all of your if you have lots of projects going on having that hard drive is really helpful. I don't, I don't trust my laptop. <laughs> um, so a uh, comment from a viewer, really interesting, thanks. Any tips on music for video? Um, as in like where to find music, do you think? I guess, or the types, you know, do you want to overlay the video with music? So um, I guess there's, okay. there's some implications around copyright with that as well, isn't there? yeah yeah so just yeah um making sure that the music is copyright free or if you uh if you want to get a, you know a specific song that you like obviously you can pay for the license um but there's loads of royalty free uh, music websites on the internet um my favorite is to go to like um if you have a google account you can go to to youtube studio and then in there, there's a, an option called audio library, and there's loads of royalty free music that um, doesn't sound very royalty free ish. So that's the one that I like to use. I know that Sarah often covers, um, or like when, when she's sort of teaching editing, that editing to the beat, just to address this kind of side of it, is a, a kind of a, a good skill to develop as an editor is understanding how um you know your music should interact with the edit and i'm sure it's also one of the sort one of the things that if you start to notice it when you watch either tv or film or adverts or things you see on social media if you pay attention to the music you then start to pick up like how people are making deliberate editing choices to interact with the, the music definitely yeah it really yeah because this is the again this is the great thing about film is that it there's so many different dimensions that can help with your storytelling so you've got is you've got the image but then you've got you know the sound and the music you can add text to it you can have movement in it as well so there's lots of yeah so thinking about the music and how it can contribute to your story is really really important hey, thanks um We've got loads and loads of questions left, but we've actually really only got time for maybe one or two more. Um, this next one is really, I guess, a hot topic currently. 
Um, what are your thoughts on AI generated videos? There seems to be several AI tools out there um, where there is no need for production anymore. Um, well, I don't think there's no need for production anymore. Don't make me scared like that. <laughs> 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 I think there is still a need for for a human um, for a human kind of aspect to whatever art there is, right? So um, I, I, I was, okay, this can go into a really long discussion, but yeah, um, I think there's always need for community and uh, a human touch to everything that we interact with. What do you think, Amy? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, it's gonna be as, you know, as, as professionals, uh, both as whether you're like you know a marketer or a filmmaker it's going to be you know I'm sure there is going to be change about how we can uh, interact with different um, softwares and stuff but it's still always going to require um, as Sarah's saying that human eye that human touch um, to you know to do something that appeal you know we can all at the moment at least most of the time tell um, you know if something has been written by a bot or if something has been and, and that is, I'm sure, going to, you know, going to get harder. But um, I think it's about how I don't think, you know, AI makes us um, useless. It, it just means that maybe the way that we, you know, in the future learn to uh, to basically make our to show our value in that, you know, as Sarah said, we it's the most human thing, you know, to tell stories and, and to have that kind of community and, and interaction. So. Um, well, Sarah and I at least both hope that. <laughs> hope that's the case. Yeah, I, I thoroughly agree. So I think that's probably a good point on which to uh, to end today. So thank you very much for that. That's a great Q and A session. Really, really useful um, presentation overall as well. So unfortunately, that's uh, all the time we got for our webinar today. Um, I'd just like to thank both Amy and Sarah for the fantastic presentation, as I say, and we do hope you've enjoyed the session and found it interesting and worthwhile. We'll be back with our next Marketing Club webinar on Wednesday 29th with CIM's very own Content Marketing Manager, Stuart Thomas. You'll find further details listed on the events and Marketing Club pages of our website. We can also register for the session. So that just leads me to say a final thank you again to Sarah and to Amy and to all of you for joining us today. And we hope you've enjoyed the webinar. Take care everyone, and we look forward to seeing you again soon.